Um, not so much now because it's kind of fading away. Um, we're also at the 51st anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, uh, Apollo 11, um, this week. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and where we've kind of come on. Um, and then we're going to bring up some highlights uh, for the coming weeks in the next show. So Tianwen-1, which is the Chinese uh, multi-Mars mission, that's coming up soon as well. Um, Terry's going to talk about what's really cool to look at in the sky um we're going to briefly touch on the spacex mission coming back um and then a little bit of coverage of of what there is to see up there so okay we are, we are ready live. to go awesome. i think we are now live so once again thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, i'm really sorry we had a few technical hitches uh so we're live a little bit later than our scheduled half seven slot um We've got Nick Howes and Terry Mosley in the house. How are you guys doing? We're fine. Pretty good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us if you're there on our YouTube channel or if you're here out on Zoom. Uh, this is where we bring you the latest and greatest of space news. I am not going to talk for much longer. I'm going to let Nick and Terry take the stage and I'll see you guys back at 8 o'clock. I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you very much. Okay, there you go. Cool. So, yeah, the first uh, item uh, in this week's roundup, or this uh, every other week's roundup, um, we're going to be talking about the UAE's launch. So the United Arab Emirates um, have recently put together and launched their first mission to Mars. Um, it's known as Al Amal, uh, or in English as Hope. Um, and it's quite an ambitious and audacious mission, costing around about $200 million. So about twice just over twice what the indian mission cost a few years ago which got into mars orbit um it's expected to be a two-year mission um it's going to take about nine months or so to get there probably arriving around about the same time as nasa's perseverance uh launch which is scheduled for a few weeks and tm11 which we'll talk about a little bit later it's an orbiter so it's not going to be doing any surface science but it does have a, quite an interesting range of instruments which are going to be looking at mars's lower and middle atmospheres so they've got a couple of really key science goals in mind one of which is looking at things like the hydrogen and the oxygen uh, loss in mars's atmosphere which is quite an interesting uh thing that hopefully will provide a lot of scientific input for not only the uae with their first mission but the collaborators as well so this isn't just the uae mission um, even though they've predominantly been responsible for most of the rocket design and, and build um, as i said it was launched from uh not from the UAE itself, it's launched from Japan uh, via JAXA, uh, the Japanese Space Agency, which is quite neat. And uh, this mission, it's around about the size of a car. Um, so it's not a tiny little microsatellite, a tiny, you know, smallish satellite, which some of the uh, more recent orbiters have been, you know, erring towards the Marcos, which accompanied the InSight lander, uh, were 12 to 16 new CubeSats uh, in terms of size and did some amazing um, observations and relayed some of the telemetry back from, the, from that spacecraft as it was going through this, its seven minutes of terror. Um, it's just acquired signal, um, which is good. So after the launch a few days ago, uh, they now have signal acquisition and it's on its way to Mars, which is good. It's got a few complex mission maneuvers it's got to undergo on its way to Mars. Um, a few mission burns, which basically will change its uh, trajectory, uh, velocity, etc., and put it hopefully on a, a really good course for Mars. Once it arrives at Mars, it's then got to decelerate, so a kind of burn in the opposite direction, which will then put it into an elliptical orbit around Mars. Um, then it will basically uh, be orbiting Mars for as long as the mission lasts for. It's solar powered, so. Uh, they've nominally, as I said, set about a one to two year mission time on it. Um, it could last for far longer. It just obviously depends on how well it's been engineered. Um, lots and lots of features on it in terms of the scientific instruments. As I said, there's been developments from Arizona State University who are big on in meteorites and Martian meteorites. ASU have got one of the biggest meteorite collections in the world. Uh, University College Berkeley, they've been involved in this. And University Colorado, University uh, College uh, Boulder in Colorado, they've been involved as well. So it's kind of a joint mission between the UAE and the United States doing a lot of the scientific instruments. There's multi-band cameras on it with specialized filters, which are designed to look at certain aspects of the atmosphere there's two spectrometers on board again which looks quite interesting um any thoughts terry on on yeah you know, how you see this mission progressing yeah i think the amazing thing is that it only took six years from the first idea to do it to actually get it launched 
uh, which is pretty remarkable. Now, I know the Americans got their uh, Apollo astronauts on the moon in eight years, but that was a, a massive offer, uh, operation taking a substantial proportion of the, the GDP. Uh, they already had a, a space um, program going. Uh, UAE hadn't. So I think to for, uh, them coming up with the idea and actually getting the, the thing built and launched within six years is remarkable. The other thing is that it's due to arrive on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the UAE. So there's a little bit of politics and promotion. And nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. Like you said, I mean, with Apollo, it was 5% of the entire GDP of the United States at the time. But the UAE is one of the richest nations on Earth. I mean, obviously, with the oil reserves, etc., that they have in the Middle East. So um, I know there's been a lot of significant funding coming out of the uh, the ruling uh, parties in the UAE. So hopefully this will be the first of many missions. And if it's a success, you can, you can as I said, hope moving forward that there's going to be more scientific um, exploration from that area. And we talked about this last time in that, you know, the, the Middle Eastern nations gave us so much scientific understanding and advancement. Yeah, uh, very much what, so. what was the dark ages uh, in the Western world? And it's, it's really great to see them kind of doing this again. So yeah. I just, I just really hope that it's a, a great success because it'll yeah. just put so much in orbit and on the surface of Mars, hopefully around about February next year between yeah. this and the Chinese and the, and the new yeah. US missions. It's a shame the, important, the European mission has been delayed, but yeah. The important thing I think is that it's due to uh, orbit Mars for and the operational side of the mission is one complete Martian year. So yep. that's very important. It's just studying the season and the atmospheric changes in Mars. And uh, it may well get a few months after that, depending on how, how it turns out. But that's the plan, a full Martian year. Yeah, so that's about 687 days, isn't it, for yeah. a Martian year? So it be it will be really interesting. And again, you know, talking about the Martian atmosphere and what can happen, there could be dust storms. We don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the Martian atmosphere over the next you know year or so. So there's going to be, we'll talk a bit, like I said, about the Chinese mission, Tianwen-1, and, you know, some of the issues they may face in terms of landing. But it will be a very, very interesting time to, to study Mars. And it's all gearing up, obviously, towards human exploration, which we're hoping within the next 15 to 20 years is going to take place on the Martian surface, which is realistically what we probably think is going to happen. But, yeah, it, it's a good time, I think, uh, to be launching stuff like this. Moving on to other launches then, um, I'm a bit closer in uh, to the inner solar system, um, European Space Agency Solar Orbiter, Terry, this one I know you're a big fan of, so. Oh yeah, well it's actually an ESA and NASA mission, a joint operation, although I think ESA is the main driver in this one. Um, the Sun, of course, is the most important body in the, in the whole universe as far as we're concerned, apart from the planet we're living on. So, uh, and believe it or not, although it's by far the closest star to us, it's one that we still don't know an awful lot about. Um, so studying the sun is becoming increasingly important as we're aware of just what the effects uh, on Earth can be if, if things were to change in the sun. So what has happened, basically it was launched in February. It has now reached its first perihelion, in other words, in its elliptical orbit. This is the first time that has got us uh, close to the sun as it's going to in this particular orbit, about roughly half the distance from um, the sun to the Earth. So it's twice as close as we are. And it has a whole suite of instruments with studying all sorts of things which are a bit technical to get into. But one of the most interesting findings is that with the very, very high resolution imaging, it's found what we're calling informally campfires on the sun. In other words, much smaller solar flares compared with the ones that we can see from Earth. Uh, and they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous, all over the surface of the sun. Now, when we say small, that's in comparison with an ordinary solar flare. These things are, are sort of almost planet-sized, but they are extremely active. They're going on all the time. And the interesting thing from the point of view of solar physics is that they think they may at least partially explain the mystery of the solar corona heating. And the, the mystery is why is the sun's atmosphere hotter as you get further away from the sun? You would expect it to be the opposite. As you move away from the fire, the temperature drops. But in the case of the sun, although the temperature is about 5,600 degrees on the surface, it's a million degrees out in the, in the corona. There have been all sorts of theories over decades to try and explain that. 
Uh, this now, I'm not a solar physicist, but this now seems to be uh, certainly one possible explanation for the heating of the solar corona. And the interesting thing is that the, the mission actually relies on a number of close encounters with Venus to change the orbit. At the moment, when it was launched, it's roughly in the plane of our solar system. You know, all the planets and the moon uh, are roughly in the same plane, Pluto accepted, except it's no longer a planet. But anyway, as it encounters Venus, its uh, inclination, orbital inclination is going to change. I think the first time it'll increase to 17 degrees in other words, above and below the, the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And then on the next one, it'll be about 33 degrees. So we'll be starting to see um, things that are happening near the poles of the sun. But the important thing is basically we need to find out exactly what is going on in the sun. If we get another what's called a Carrington super flare, it will play havoc with uh, all our IT, our communication systems, our navigation systems. Airliners uh, rely on, on, on that for a GPS to, to get to their destination. There could be massive power outages and so on. Uh, it's really essential that we know exactly what's happening in the sun, get as much warning of any of these super flares that, that may be heading our way. Our way. There's another major probe there uh, on its way, the Parker Solar Probe, which is an American one. So between the two of them, we hope to learn what we need to know about the sun. And they're getting it a lot closer. As you said, for years now, we've had the Solar Dynamics Observatories and SOHO yeah. Observatories, which have been giving us really good insights and some of the early warning predictions for some of these like flare events, as you've said. The last one, a few decades ago, took out the electrical grid in Canada. Mm -hmm. So something the size of the Carrington event, which is in the mid-1800s, yes, would absolutely devastate most of the communication satellites, most satellites, actually, in orbit. And we haven't had one since the epoch of like CubeSats and some of the smaller form factor satellites, which don't have the capability to resist these kind of strengths of events even larger satellites would really struggle so it will be really really critical you talked about these campfires if you're looking at the image that you can hopefully all see on your screen now towards the kind of four o'clock position the bottom right there's something that looks a little bit like an apostrophe that's one of these campfires yeah. in action and that's the size of france so these things are not small <laughs> relative the the sun obviously could swallow up the earth a million times over um it's these things are not small let's just put it that way so if we had a big mass coronal mass ejection and if you want to go onto youtube videos and look at coronal mass ejections you'll see the kind of scale of events that we're talking about these things typically i've imaged solar prominences and and cmes that are the size of the distance between the earth and the moon so you're looking at 200 plus thousand miles distance you know just for an explosion on the sun so we need to know about this as terry said it's really really important you mentioned the Carrington event, and that was the only one that did actually hit us. But there was one uh, decade or so, I can't remember exactly when, which just missed us, basically. Yeah. Uh, and we, that was just a matter of sheer luck. Sooner or later, we are going to get hit again. Oh, yes. And we'll talk a bit more about that with relation to Comet soon. But moving yeah. back out now. So we've come all the way out and then all the way back in again to the sun. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope. So this uh, is the an inverted commas successor to the Hubble. Uh, it's not really a uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Predominantly works in the UV and the visible range of the spectrum. It touches into the near infrared. Uh, but predominantly, it's known for its visual imaging, UV imaging, etc. Um, this is a whole of a scale of instruments. It's been in planning and development now by Northrop Grumman, a big defense contractor, for decades. It is so far behind in terms of its launch schedule. Um, there was serious concern about this because some of the instruments have been ready for quite some time. The University of Edinburgh's team, a uh, team in the UK, have built one of the key instruments, the MIRI uh, instrument on board. That's been ready for some years now. Um, the other key problem with this is the technical challenge with it. Unlike the Hubble, which is orbiting at around about 570 kilometers of the Earth and had the ability to do a repair, and we had several repair and upgrade missions, which replaced the onboard cameras, replaced the optics, uh, put spectacles on it, as it were, to correct for the mirror. Uh, anomaly with the Hubble. With this one, you can't. This is going to be one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth, uh, a place called L2, Lagrange point two. So it's a stable orbit. Basically, it allows it to kind of sit there in space, which is great. It needs to be as far away from the Earth as possible. It's got a massive sun shield on it because it's an infrared instrument. It needs to be cooled because it's looking for heat signatures in objects. So you're in the infrared part of the spectrum. The wavelength is longer. Therefore, having a larger mirror is going to give you improved resolution. 
Now, this thing potentially could see back almost to the, the earliest epochs of the, the formation of our universe. So that's the plan with it. It will also be able to look at things like atmospheres around nearby exoplanets. So the potential for essentially helping us work out if there is life on some of the nearby exoplanets is another key thing. Um, it's going to really revolutionize science. However, this thing is huge. And as you can see from the image there, it's made up of kind of hexagonal segmented mirrors which have to unfurl. There isn't a spacecraft large enough currently on Earth. Um, Starship, uh, SpaceX's Starship in the future may be able to launch something bigger, but this really needs to be kind of folded in on itself. The problem with that is it then needs to unfold. And before we came on air, Terry and I were talking about the uh, seven minutes of terror with the, with the Mars landers. This has got 14 days of terror. So this thing has to basically go through several hundred unfurling maneuvers Maneuvers, all of which have to be done precisely while it's heading out from Earth to this Lagrange 2 point. Uh, all the mirrors need to unfurl, the structure needs to unfurl, the sun shield, which is the size of a tennis court, needs to unfurl correctly and all lock into position to a level of precision that you can't even imagine. If you look at the Hubble Space Telescope and you know the images that first came from that due to the mirror being slightly out and that was out by microns. It was it was in, insane how precise it had to be ground. It's the same with this. These gold plated mirrors, you can see that they, they're gold in colour, they are gold plated and it's literally a finer skim of gold um, which is basically providing the reflectivity. All of these have to be precisely aligned. And any of the amateur astronomers listening will know all about that with collimation. If you've got a reflecting telescope or a schmidt grain, you'll know all about alignment and making sure that your collimation is spot on so that your focus is spot on. So you've got all of this to take into account. And you have a telescope that cannot be fully integration tested. Uh, they've gone through masses of Norfolk Grumman have been going through, I think it's over 1,300 different system tests with this in the last few weeks. Um, I mean, it's been tested to death and the delays obviously due to COVID and various other things have impacted on it. And it's now been bumped from March next year to October next year. But it can't be fully integration tested. The, the whole spacecraft, the sun shield and the primary mirror and all of the instruments literally is too large to fit in any vacuum chamber on the planet. So, and you think the vacuum chambers that you used to test the Apollo uh, command module, lunar module, etc., back in the 60s, it's still not big enough. This thing is absolutely enormous. It's gone through two very near cancellations in the past. I was in a meeting at NEF in New York about 10 years ago when an astronomer by the name of Heidi Hamill was talking about the potential that this was going to be cancelled. And we set up a whole kind of um, social media group and, and really got behind making sure that it wasn't cancelled and getting all the Congress people in the United States to kind of uh, support it. And I got invited over to Goddard as a result of that and saw this thing being built in the clean room at NASA Goddard. And it is huge. It's absolutely staggering. Um, $8.8 .8 billion as well. So if this goes wrong, and given the delays we've got with Boeing with the SLS system, and that's $10 billion over budget, um, you're looking at the GDP of a small country here on basically a launcher and a telescope. This is going to be launched as well by the European Space Agency on an Ariane. Um, if that goes wrong, it's going to make the Boston Tea Party look like a walk in the park. Um, so it's it's interesting times ahead. So October, and the other one, it's launching on Halloween next year. So it could be, <laughs> it could be the biggest nightmare NASA have ever had. But yeah, October the 31st next year james webb um terry any thoughts on that yeah uh the other thing is the ariane 5 is a big beast of a rocket and the vibration that this thing will be undergoing as it heads up uh, through the atmosphere with dr fillings out so one of the, the retests they have to do actually is the acoustic and vibration test it is absolutely critical that this thing survives the launch never mind all the deployments that are due to happen afterwards but if it works, and let's be hopeful, it will revolutionize what we uh, learn about the early universe. And a very, very sort of hot topic at the moment is studying exoplanets. The thing about uh, observing in the infrared is basically with the expanding universe, back in the, uh, the very early universe, everything has uh, moved so far since then. The light stretching as it uh, reaches us from 13 odd billion years ago, you're really only getting your images in the infrared which is why this is, uh, it has to be uh, operational in the infrared and cooled down, not to absolute zero, but to well, well below uh, ambient temperatures on Earth, which is why you need the, the um, big sun shield. So um, 
What do you give it 50 50 chance of success? I, I'm hoping, I mean, Northrop Grumman have done some remarkable work and, you know, they've got a heritage going back to Apollo. So I'm hoping that all of the testing, and I know people who've worked on this, and I know the PI, um, John Mather, won the Nobel Prize, and the deputy PI, Amber Straw, is a good friend. So I'm really hopeful that this is going going to work and be a huge success like terry said it's going to give us insights not only into exoplanets but to the earliest formation of the of the universe itself the hubble ultra deep field probably one of the deepest farthest images ever taken by the hubble space telescope that'll be a walk in the park for this thing uh, it'll be able to stretch way beyond so who knows what we're going to see is the thing and some of the earliest galaxy formation now we're starting to to see things that we didn't predict with early galaxy formation in terms of the rate of the galaxy formation and um, you know the, this kind of early epoch of the of the universe's uh, kind of inception as it were so it, it will be very very interesting and i for one can't wait i just as you said really hope it's going to work because yeah. we haven't got a second chance you're not going to be sending up mike massimino and john grunsfeld and those guys to perform a, a service mission on it because you just can't we don't have the technology right now so it's even no, be I, I'm being a bit pessimistic there it has been tested and retested uh yeah. you know everything possible has been done to make sure and is being done to make sure that this thing works yeah absolutely so fingers crossed yeah coming a little bit closer to home um and this is the hot topic in in most of astronomy at the moment comet nearwise so it's faded. Um, I was out imaging it for the past few nights. I've uh, been posting some stuff on, on my Facebook page and on Twitter uh, with some telescopes because it's now got high enough up that I can image it with the telescopes rather than just with an SLR in the back garden. Um, it is fading quite rapidly and it's barely visible now to the naked eye from most locations. You really need to be uh, in a very good dark site to see it. But the tail is now absolutely enormous. It's huge. And I say the tail, there are actually three tails with this one. So so comets typically will form a dust tail as they approach the sun and you've got basically the ices and uh, surface uh, of the comet will sublimate and basically will drag off some of the surface dust and that will always point away from the sun so the sun's radiation energy etc is pushing all this away from the sun which is great and then you get ionization as well so you get ionization of uh, some of the gases on the surface and again you create this beautiful ion tail what we're seeing with this comet as well is quite not rare it's been seen on other comets, but a sodium tail. Um, and that's really quite interesting, isn't it, Terry? Yep. Yep. That's, um, you're not going to see that with the naked eye. You'll be very, very lucky to see, see it with binoculars. If you have a powerful telescope, you may be able to see uh, the two brightest tails, the ion tail and the dust tail. Uh, but for those who want to see it and haven't seen it yet, basically, you go out and you try and find the plow, which is tilted over, or the, the Big Dipper, as the Americans call it, I think is probably more appropriate if you think of it in that uh, context. It's just below the bowl of the saucepan of the Big Dipper. A dipper is a saucepan. And uh, about 10, 15 degrees above the horizon, depending when you're looking. If you have binoculars, you have a fair chance of seeing it. And then if you locate it, and if you've uh, got a good dark sky, you may be able to spot it with the naked eye. Now, the thing is, you'll have probably seen loads of fantastic photographs on uh, social media on the internet. Those are taken with very, very powerful, very sensitive modern cameras. You're not going to see it like that with the naked eye. But nevertheless, if you've never seen a comet before, this is the best one around and the best one we've had in the Northern Hemisphere since Hale Bop, basically, in the last century. Yeah, 1997, I remember watching Hellbot from central yeah. London. You could literally see it from the middle of Oxford Street, which yeah. is one of the brightest locations pretty much in the UK. Um, this is nowhere near that, definitely not. What is interesting about this, though, and it kind of touches on to things we talked about before, this was only detected at the end of March. And this is a comet travelling at over 100,000 miles an hour that has got a five-kilometre-wide nucleus. Now, five-kilometre-wide, it's not as big as, in inverted commas, the one that killed the dinosaurs. Um, it's roughly about half to a third of the size of that one but this is still a significant object that the best observatories both in orbit and on the earth only detected at the end of march which this reached perihelion early july so you're looking at about three four months between detection and its closest approach to the sun so if it was on an earth intersect orbit again you could be looking at anywhere between three possibly six possibly nine months unlike in the movie deep impact which gave us two years so Again, please, 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 governments of the world, put more money into detecting and mitigation, not just finding them. 
it's all very well that we've got you know increased sky surveys we've got the ability to look out for these things that's fantastic we can now see when we're going to die we need to start pouring money into how we're going to stop us all going to die because one of these days one of these things is going to be coming our way and there's a movie coming out actually i don't know if it's going to be any good um called greenland which is due for release in about a month or two's time kind of taking the deep impact armageddon scenario and bring it into the into the modern era um the trailer looks really good if you've not seen it um I said I can't really see if the film's going to be any good at the moment, but it's going to be one to watch if you really want to see what the potential threat is of a cometary impact on this planet. Um, do take it seriously. If there's anyone who's got any influence on government, more money needs to go into that, please, please, please. Speaking of money going into stuff, we're going to go back about 50 years now. So this week, uh, 51 years ago, um, and there would have obviously been big celebrations if it wasn't for a global pandemic, uh, we saw the first lunar landing, the Apollo 11 moon, moon landing. Um, what's interesting about this now, I mean, it's not just that you know we're celebrating this incredible achievement 51 years on still. It's the fact that the science is still being done. The moon rocks uh, are still being you know, analysed. Uh, 480 kilogram plus of moon rocks that were brought back between Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 are still being analysed. However, in the last week, we found out some really interesting new information. So some research done by German, uh, a team of German scientists, one of them doing his PhD research, uh, has worked out that the moon's formation is actually younger uh, than we thought. Terry. Thoughts. Right. Yes. Um, 87 million years, to be precise. I don't know what the error bars in, are on either side of that, but that's the, the figure they estimate. Um, this is a big, big sort of a topic in itself, the formation of the moon. They think it was caused by an object the size of Mars colliding with the Earth and uh, at a glancing blow and knocking off a whole lot of stuff off into space. And that gives you an explanation for the composition of the moon. Some Earth material, some Mars in inverted commas or the original object material. It's very complicated, all to do with the isotope ratios and all the rest of it. Uh, but as you say, this latest work does indicate that that uh, event, which is still the best explanation for the origin of the moon, it actually occurred 87 million years uh, later than we thought. And uh, just shows you, again, our nearest object in space, and we're still finding out about it. The other interesting thing in terms of anniversary is actually this is the exact day uh, since 1961 when Gus Grissom became the second American in space before your time, Nick. <laughs> Liberty but, Bell. <laughs> uh, this is actually the day. It was only a suborbital flight after Alan Shepard, two suborbital flights, and then they had John Glenn doing the orbit. So uh, what is that? 1961 to now, 69 years, is it? Um, so this is the exact day. So how far have we come since then? 59, yeah, I know. It's amazing. Liberty Bell. I, 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 yeah. You say it's before my time, Tony. I've got a piece of Liberty Bell. Um, uh, so, you. <laughs> so when they recovered it, so basically, if you don't know the story of Liberty Bell, um, after exactly. Gus Grissom was one of these amazing astronauts, um, part of the original Mercury 7, and potentially would have been the first person on the moon had he not sadly have died in the Apollo 1 fire in the late 1960s. Um, but Gus Grissom had flown Liberty Bell, uh, really successful, for almost flawless mission, splashed down, all going well, and then the hatch blew. Now, the hatch basically blew outwards from the spacecraft, and due to the sea state at the time, water started pouring into the cockpit and essentially started dragging the spaceship uh, under. Gus Grissom managed to scramble out literally like by the skin of his teeth, um, got hauled up by a helicopter. The helicopter, bizarrely, was trying to save the spacecraft more than trying to save Gus. So Gus is kind of flapping about in the ocean uh, while they're trying to save this multi-million dollar spacecraft from sinking. But it, unfortunately, it did sink. Um, and it sunk about 12,000 feet into the uh, into the depths of the ocean. It was recovered uh, by a guy called Kurt Newport um, just over a decade or so ago. Then it was taken to the Kansas Cosmosphere, um, which is a big museum and restoration site in the United States and they've restored it to its original state. It's beautiful. Uh, but one of the things they did to pay for the restoration was they sold off, they, there were film reels that were recovered with it. Inside the cockpit, there were reel, reels of film. And basically, these film reels were then put into strips and they're mounted in Lucite. And I've got one of these. So I've got a part of this spacecraft that had Gus Grissom in. Um, yeah, it's, it was an amazing mission. The second, yeah. uh, second Civil War with the laughter Alan Shepard, but it was flawless. And then Gus went on to fly Gemini and then would have flown Apollo 1, um, but but for the uh, the sad fire event, obviously, in, uh, in 2001. 
in January of 67. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have started you on Gus Grissom. Oh, don't even get me going on Gus. <laughs> don't even get me going on Gus. He's, he, was, he was a real kind of yeah, amazing... Such a tragedy, guy. Apollo 1. Yeah, amazing astronaut as well. So, moving back out a little bit, uh, we're going to briefly just highlight some things that are coming up in the next show. So, we talked about the UAE's mission. Uh, the next one that's going to launch, uh, we've got two actually. So, we've got NASA's Perseverance, but also Tianwen 1. So, this is the first Chinese mission uh, to the Red Planet, which will be, again, very interesting combination of an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about that hopefully in the next issue, but we just wanted to kind of highlight that as, a, as something to look out for if the Chinese broadcasting uh, services allow us to watch the launch live it's going to be really really important to watch really interesting mission um, putting a rover down about the size of spirit and opportunity which nasa launched some decades ago now um, nominal lifespan they're aiming for about 90 days same with spirit and opportunity but who knows i mean those things lasted for well well long their yeah. original lifespan so i'm looking forward to this one uh, how about you terry Yep, definitely. I think the earliest launch date is just two days from now, but uh, the window stays open for a week or two after that. Yep. So it'll depend on weather and uh, sort of no last minute hitches. Interestingly, it's due to land in Utopia Planitia, where Viking 2 landed way back in 1976. And an interesting aspect of that is they deliberately picked it because it's one of the lowest areas on the surface of Mars. And that means you have a greater amount of atmosphere available to slow down as you're, you're going down to touch down. Uh, also a very interesting area, but uh, they, they haven't said exactly where they're going to la land on that, but that's one of the factors they took into account. Uh, obviously, the deeper down you go, the more uh, dense the atmosphere is. So that's very important when you're trying to slow down. It's interesting as well that a landing ellipse, you told you at Planitia, as you said, um, was Viking 2's landing site, but their landing ellipse covers all the way to Elysium Mons, so yeah. they're going to be really close to some of the volcanic regions, and with the capabilities that this rover is going to have in terms of soil composition, and obviously what the orbiter is doing as well, which is going to have subsurface radar analysis, and it's going into a polar orbit over Mars, uh, which would be quite interesting, because it's going to be able to do a, a really detailed mapping, hopefully, of the subsurface water and ice on Mars. Um, that in combination with what the rover is delivering again will give us hopefully a lot more information in terms of the recently discovered tectonic activity that we're seeing from insight and hopefully some more pointers and clues towards what's causing this methane so um, really interesting mission very much looking forward to that one as well um, going back out a little further um, saturn's now at opposition um, the rings are truly stunning if you've got a telescope well worth a look terry i know this is one of your absolute favorite planets Absolutely. It's the most beautiful thing in the sky, in my opinion. Uh, there are some fantastic photographs that are taken with uh, uh, amazing powerful instruments that give you, you know, some of the planetary nebulae are amazing, but for something that you can actually see with your own eye, there's nothing that even comes close to Saturn. Everybody that I've showed Saturn to through a telescope has just said, wow. And to see it, uh, okay, you're not going to see all the detail that you can see in the fantastic photographs that have come from Hubble and the Cassini mission and so on. But to see it yourself in 3D, hanging in a black sky is just an amazing thing. It's also a fascinating planet with some amazing, uh, interesting satellites going around, and particularly Europa, a, a prime candidate for possibility of life in our solar system. It was actually at opposition yesterday, which means it's directly opposite the sun in the sky and pretty much at its uh, closest to the Earth, so now's a good time to look at it. Uh, the rings you can see, even in good powerful binoculars, and certainly they're spectacular in the telescope, um, the biggest moon, Titan, which is another fascinating object, you could do a whole program about Titan. Uh, it's normally visible even in good binoculars, uh, but for the other fainter satellites, uh, you probably need a telescope. But um, if you get a chance at a star party or uh, anywhere where you can get a look at Saturn through a telescope, do so, you won't regret it. It's just Absolutely. beautiful. Yeah, I mean, just to, to pull you up a little bit, yeah, I think you've just must have been a slip of the tongue there. You said uh, Europa, Enceladus. Oh, sorry, Enceladus. <laughs> yes, indeed. Or Enceladus, as we. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What's wonderful about looking at Saturn, um, I think, and looking at Titan in particular, is if you look at Titan, Titan's really quite obvious. If you've got even a modest sized telescope, you can go on Amazon. I mean, th this is a great thing about lockdown. People have got more time and spending more and more time with the family and, you know, showing your kids um, Saturn is really, really interesting. But even a modest sized Dobsonian telescope, uh, which is 
you know, quite you know, movable for most people. Put that up in your back garden. It's not very high at the moment. Saturn and Jupiter are quite close to each other. But looking at it through a telescope, you'll definitely see Titan with a modest sized telescope. And if you look at it, just think and, and remember that there is a spacecraft on that. Yeah. So the European Space Agency had a joint mission with NASA. This is kind of how things are definitely working these days, these joint collaborations. Um, the Solar Orbiter, as Terry was saying before, the Solo mission. 90% of that is European Space Agency, but there is some collaboration from NASA. Um, back in the late 90s, there was the Cassini mission, uh, which was one of the most ambitious and audacious missions where it flew through the ring system of Saturn. And it could have ended really badly anyway. Um, but that was about the size of a bus. And on board, it had the Huygens space probe. And that thing landed on Titan. It's still the farthest landing ever by humanity on any other body. Um, plowed through the atmosphere, took some spectacular images as it's coming down, which have been put into really nice videos now. So you can see these almost dendritic delta-like channels. If you look at um, the north coast of Africa near to, like, obviously the, the coast of Egypt, uh, you can see very similar kind of del delta formations. It's really, really beautiful to see. Um, Titan also has methane lakes. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting world. And to, to just look at it and Titan's one of the few things when you look at through a telescope, and, and Saturn in particular, when you look through a telescope, that it actually matches what you are seeing with the pictures, if you've got a good sized telescope. It's not going to be as spectacular, as you said, in the Hubble ones, but it is something you can see. Even a modest sized telescope, you can see the gap, the famous Cassini division there in the ring system. It's really, really fantastic to see, definitely. One yep. of the best. Um as I say, it's at its best at the moment. Uh, it's very easy to see because it's quite close to the brightest object apart from the moon in the night sky, apart from Venus, which only comes up just before dawn, and that's Jupiter. And sorry for that little slip of the tongue. Europa, of course, is a satellite of Jupiter. And you can see the four main satellites of Jupiter with good binoculars, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, so when Celadus, yes, that's the one I was, I was thinking of. It's, it's, so the it's, it's, it's the two E's. Uh, will not mention it. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. The, um, Saturn is just to the left of Jupiter, and they're both due south at uh, local midnight if you ignore uh, summertime. Uh, fascinating just to see the two biggest planets in our solar system just so close together in the sky. They'll actually be extremely close together in the sky in December. We'll probably talk about that again. And then also, um, in fact, you can see all five of the main naked eye planets uh, in the sky tonight, if you look. Uh, you have Jupiter and Saturn at their best. Over considerably to the left of them, uh, to the east as you're looking, is Mars, which is also coming up to a very good opposition in October. And then if you're a real uh, fanatic, you can stay on to almost uh, the dawn twilight and you'll see Venus, which is the brightest of the objects apart from the moon in the night sky. And below and to the left of it, you can see Mercury as well. So if you want to see all five of the naked eye planets, you can do so tonight. That's amazing. Yeah. If, you, if you think that up until the time of the discovery of Uranus in 1781, that's what people could see. Yeah. So it really is uh, an amazing opportunity. Uh, if, you, if you're willing to pull an all nighter, if you haven't got work in the morning, well worth doing just to say you've done it and you've seen them. Yeah. And it, from about, it, sorry, it, for about 10 past four onwards, uh, depending where you are in the UK, up until the dawn twilight gets too back, that too bright, that's when to look for, for Mercury, which is the hardest of those five to see. And always be very careful if you're looking at Mercury, because obviously you're looking in a sunward direction, especially if you've got a telescope. Just make sure that as soon as the sun does peer its head above the horizon, yeah. you don't you don't keep looking, because obviously yeah. you don't want to have any accidents or, or incidents with that. But as Terry was saying, having Saturn and Jupiter so close to each other, if you've got a modest-sized telescope, just being able to dart just a, a, literally a few degrees left and right of each other, it's, yeah. it's amazing to kind of dance between these two planets. And the distances, Jupiter obviously significantly closer than Saturn, you know, Jupiter's distance around about 500 million kilometers from the Earth. Saturn's around about a billion kilometers from the Earth. So uh, depending on where it is in its orbit. But we are looking at, you know, two of the, the big gas giants of our solar system and two of the most spectacular objects in the night sky. So definitely, definitely go and see those. Yeah. Um, coming back. Oh, sorry. Terry, go I was on. just going to say, you talked about the size of the sun. Jupiter is so big that we'd hold 1,000 planet Earths. So that gives you some idea of the relative oh, no. size. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, the the great solar, the great storm on Jupiter, uh, the Great Red Spot. You could fit the yeah. Earth two and a half, three times in that. Yeah. So again, if you've got a decent sized telescope, you can actually see Jupiter's rotation. 
Uh, it's, it's amazing watching it over several hours. If you take even modest photographs of it like, and say you separate them by an hour, you will see features moving across the surface and you'll see the moons moving around it. So well worth seeing. Coming back in closer, um, just going to touch on this closely, uh, quickly, because this is going to be happening before our next show. Um, so SpaceX, uh, Bob and Doug have been up on the International Space Station doing spacewalks, various scientific experiments, lots of proving on the Crew Dragon capsule. That's coming back, um, leaving the ISS on August the 1st for splashdown August the 2nd. What will be interesting to watch with this one, judging on how smooth the launch was, because it literally looked like the smoothest ride I've ever seen in my life in a spacecraft, how smooth the re-entry is going to be. Because coming back on the space shuttle, any of the astronauts who've flown both the space shuttle and Apollo will tell you this, people like um, the, some of the Skylab crew, uh, Jack Lausma being uh, one of the key ones who flew, flew both shuttle uh, and Apollo, John Young as well, uh, always said that the space shuttle was a really nice smooth ride. This is going to be interesting uh coming back in in a capsule that's basically a, a kind of for you know next step on from apollo in terms of the onboard computers etc it's obviously vastly more sophisticated but we are looking at a cone-shaped capsule uh, re-entering the earth's atmosphere relying on a heat shield and splashing down in the ocean so it'll be really interesting to see how smooth this one is in comparison yeah. to it's not like in the science fiction films or Star Trek or whatever. You are basically burning away the outer layers of the spacecraft to slow down as you're coming through the air. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to go to space. I think the bit coming back down again is probably one of the more terrifying bits. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that re-entry from low Earth orbit. It's not too bad. I mean, you know, they're still going to be hitting the atmosphere at 17,000 plus miles an hour and decelerating. And then they've got to make sure that the drogue chutes and then the main parachutes yeah. deploy and slow them down enough to, to obviously hit the ocean at, you know, a few tens of kilometers uh, per hour. Uh, so hopefully nice and safe not too bad um it's what we're all hoping for for the, for the crew because it has been a spectacularly successful mission after the initial delays with the weather um not quite what they went through with like apollo 10 through to 13 where they were hitting the atmosphere at twenty four thousand miles an hour still the fastest thing that a human beings ever flown on um that would have been harrowing um especially with 1960s technology and as you, you said terry you've got an ablative heat shield basically so yeah. it just burns away um I've got bits of that as well. Uh, but we won't even go there on that one. Bits of plugs. Uh, and then finally, uh, we just, we've covered a little bit of this, but what to look up for? What, what are the key highlights that you're looking out for, Terry, over the campaign? Yeah, well, I sort of uh, took the opportunity of talking about um, Jupiter and Saturn to, to cover that. The only other thing that's around at the moment, apart from uh, the comet, which you should try and get a view of in the next couple of days before it gets too faint. We're coming up to uh, the Perseid meteors. In fact, one or two have already shown up in some of the photographs of the, the comet. The, the shower reaches its peak in July, or sorry, in August, the 11th, 12th of August. But um, it's already starting to produce a few meteors. So if you are looking out uh, for the comet, uh, have a look out in case you see a, a meteor coming from the constellation Perseus. And uh, the other good thing is that we're getting a few more passes of the International Space Station up until the end of the month, roughly. So that's always worth looking out for. And the Heavens Above site uh, on the um, internet will give you all the details of that for your, your own location. And we're coming to the end of the summer twilight period for, um, you know, the sky never gets really dark all through the night if you're in the northern half of the UK. So you can now look uh, for really, really dark skies for the comet or for meteors or anything like that. But I think the main spectacle of the moment is uh, the Jupiter and Saturn conjunction together in the, in the south. Um, well worth looking at, having a look at, even with the naked eye, because Jupiter is so bright, so much brighter than any of the stars. Yeah, and touching on the Perseids and obviously the ISS, which is quite an interesting thing. If you have got clouds, obviously we had about, in the UK anyway, about nine weeks of almost perfect skies at the beginning of lockdown. It was literally, it was sunshine all the way. The yeah. last few weeks, it's been a bit hit and miss, a bit intermittent. We've had a few good nights uh, the last few weeks. It's looking a bit overcast again tonight as I'm looking out the window. Um, if you have got a cloudy sky, there are ways you can still observe these things. And what's interesting, the ISS is doing... Uh, something quite uh, quite interesting with um, what's called slow scan TV. So there's a radio transmitter on the ISS that amateurs can pick up from Earth. Um, there's a thing called SDR, software-defined radios. These little kind of dongles that plug in, they're like USB sticks that plug into
into a laptop. They only cost about £20. You can buy one of these, connect it up to a small antenna, and you can pick up these TV signals from the ISS and listen to some of the communications. You can also listen to and pick up data from a whole range of satellites. And even if you don't have one of these dongles, there's a thing called Web SDR, where you can log into websites that have got these radio telescopes pointing up, and you can listen to them. And then you can relay that data if you use software and there's loads of hints on the internet of how to do this just look up web sdr and slow scan tv and NOAA. you can pick up satellites that are doing things like weather observation um, and you can just decode your own data on your own laptop um, for literally no investment at all you can you can do it for free so well worth doing um if you don't have you know good skies the other thing with the perseids is that as these meteors hit the upper atmosphere the ionization that they cause basically causes um a kind of a doppler frequency shifted ping in radio frequencies and again you can use web sdr or you can build your own little radio uh, receiver and listen to these things so even if you've got completely clouded skies you can still hear the meteors as they enter the atmosphere it's a lot of fun to do definitely worth uh, worth looking at yeah. even in daylight actually yeah absolutely it's yeah. that's the great thing about radio astronomy it doesn't need a dark sky yeah. <laughs> and on that note um we'd like to thank everyone who's listened in on youtube on zoom thank the space store team as ever for their great sorting out of our little technical issues at the beginning um and it's good night from me and good night from him <laughs> <laughs> see you too okay oh, bye right thank you so much guys for another incredible roundup um, I've got a couple of announcements for our audience. We are going to be taking a break with our Thursday night talks for the summer. We'll be back in October with those. The roundup will be continuing, however, and we'll see you back again on the 4th of August at 7.30. If you've got kids, do tune in to our Kids AM on a weekly basis and do give us a thumbs up if you like this. Uh, share it with your friends who are interested in space and follow us on our social media channels Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, we're on there as well. And finally, go check out our website events. All of our events are on our website page. Um, and if you really want to keep up to date, sign up to our mailing list. Um, thank you for once again for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone Thanks. who joined us on Zoom. And yeah, we'll Share the you YouTube again. link as well. <laughs> Shall, yes. And we'll see you again in a couple of Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great week, everyone. Cheers.